It's been more than six months since Hamas terrorists killed more than 1,400 Israelis in the brutal October 7th attack and took hundreds more hostage. Israel quickly ordered a complete siege of Gaza in response. And since then, the country's defense force has killed more than 30,000 Palestinians, according to the Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry, whose numbers are considered credible. Since October 7th, fear and grief have reverberated through Jewish communities around the world, including here in New England. I'm joined now by Israel's Consul General for this region, Miron Rubin, who previously served as the country's ambassador to Paraguay, Bolivia, and Colombia, and Israel's permanent representative to the United Nations. Ambassador Rubin, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So, Israel's, the attacks of October 7th are often, in America, called Israel's 9-11. In my experience, that's not accurate. 9-11 was a disaster for the United States, but I don't know a single person who was killed on 9-11. I have many Israeli friends and students, and I don't know one who wasn't personally affected by the attacks on October 7th. So I wonder if I could ask you to talk about how you were personally, like how you, who you knew, how you were personally affected by the attacks. Well, um, one must remember that 9-11 uh, happened in a country of over 300 million people, whereas uh, um, October the 7th happened uh, in a country of uh, just under 10 million. Uh, so if you uh, take the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and uh, you compare the numbers, then it would be like uh, uh, about 1,800 uh, people being massacred uh, in um, Massachusetts. Uh, and so uh, uh, on that horrific scale, you would definitely find people uh, that you knew. Uh, only yesterday I was talking to uh, an Israeli student in one of the uh, universities here whose sister actually uh, was in the uh, uh, Nova uh, music festival uh, and uh, managed to escape uh, unharmed, I would say unharmed physically, but uh, I think that physical scar will remain with her sister for many a year. I would just like to uh, touch on what you said at the beginning as you introduced me. Um, the numbers of the Hamas Palestinian terrorist organization are definitely not credible. Uh, I don't think anybody has uh, a firm grip on the number uh, of people. And when you mention uh, a, a big number, you don't seem to mention any of the combatants. Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, think that we have uh, managed uh, uh, to uh, kill uh, anywhere between uh, 12 and 13,000 of the Hamas uh, fighters. And we also think that their uh, numbers are slightly inflated, but that we cannot uh, answer at this moment. So, and, and certainly in the middle of a war, it's very difficult to have credible casualty estimates, you know, for, yes. for any of the combatants and under the thing. But even uh, afterwards, I think we will uh, find that uh, maybe some of the pronouncements of, uh, of people uh, who seem to be uh, experts maybe were wrong, and I would definitely like to hear some of them in the future. Uh, apologize. So certainly if an expert's wrong to the mm -hmm. conflict, they should. I, I should note, Ambassador, though, that the Israeli government itself has used the, the state intelligence uh, from the Gaza Ministry of Health as its estimates. And you can see in this report that Israeli intelligence studies have studied civilian casualty figures released by the Hamas-run Ministry of Health, and it is certainly run by Hamas. I'm not debating that at all in Gaza and concluded the figures were generally accurate despite earlier public claims by U.S. and Israeli officials that they are not. So in the absence of other claims, is it sort of valid to use Well, that? in the absence of other claims, uh, we will uh, use what the terrorists say. Uh, but even then, uh, when uh, people talk about the amount of casualties, they lump together uh, the terrorists who have been killed uh, uh, along with uh, civilians. And uh, may I remind your viewers that we are in a war situation. So, sir, I don't think anybody for forgets. I think forget. people have a tendency to forget. And in fact, in the note of war station, we just had this attack from Iran on Israel. And I wonder if you could comment on that so that there was a sort of, there was a, one person was severely injured in the attack. But, a young Bedouin uh, girl, yes. Yeah. But remarkably, other than that, it seems to have been entirely neutralized by a combination of Israeli defenses and allied countries. And so for me, what I was particularly struck by is what is surely the first time in the history of Israel, not just American forces sort of coming in to, to help protect Israel, which has happened before in 1991, but Arab countries 
seem to have rallied to Israel's defense. And, well, I think, I think we've seen here a, a, a very interesting uh, coalition uh, that sort of uh, uh, has been formed uh, in, in a very interesting way. First and foremost, uh, what happened on uh, a Saturday uh, evening, the 13th uh, of this month, uh, is a game changer, without any doubt. Uh, it's not that Iran hasn't been uh, uh, trying to do its utmost uh, to do away with the state of Israel, uh, but uh, this is the first time uh, in our 76-year history uh, that uh, Iran has launched uh, more than 320 uh, uh, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles and drones from its territory uh, uh, and sent them towards uh, the state of Israel. Uh, some of them did get through, uh, but the vast majority didn't. And as you said, uh, thanks to uh, a very uh, interesting coalition, uh, whereby, uh, of course, uh, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom uh, and France and uh, other countries in the uh, Middle East um, uh, were, uh, to a certain extent, uh, joined together in a coalition that uh, helped or allowed Israel Israel uh, to, uh, uh, to look after itself, shall I say. So, uh, and, you know, this is sort of a striking moment, right, that other, a large coalition of countries, including countries that historically you would think of as enemies to Israel, were not willing to participate, were, were actu actually Correct. took active steps to defend Israel in the, from this attack. Um, well, I'm not privy to all of that information, but uh, according to the press reports, press reports and, yeah. and things like that, yes, I presume uh, that we have seen a very uh, interesting uh, coalition coalesce, but uh, it is sort of part of a change that we've seen in the uh, uh, in the region uh, that started, I would say, uh, just a few years ago with the Abraham Accords, uh, where we saw uh, uh, agreements between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, uh, and uh, to a certain extent, Sudan, uh, and a, a, a change whereby uh, we also uh, felt that we were uh, stepping towards uh, um, uh, some kind of uh, relationship uh, both with maybe Saudi Arabia and other uh, Muslim states uh, further afield. So I think that this is uh, something that uh, I think the Iranians and through its proxies were trying also to uh, uh, to deal a blow to. So in fact it is widely believed that the Hamas attacks were partly motivated to try and stop those relationships as they were progressing. So then I, I then ask is, what are the plans for the Israeli government to build on this moment to try and further and try and further repair those relations? Well, I think first and foremost we must understand that the, this blatant uh, attack uh, f by the Iranians on Israel uh, should be uh, uh, seen as such. Uh, and uh, what we hope uh, will come out of this is uh, a lot more pressure on uh, uh, the Iranian clerical government uh, to uh, uh, maybe rein in some of their uh, proxies. As you know, they've been attacking Israel through their proxies uh, for years and decades. Only two weeks ago, the Argentinian president uh, uh, announced that uh, it was actually Iran uh, through Hezbollah that attacked the Israeli embassy uh, in Buenos Aires over uh, some 30 years ago. So uh, uh, it's not the first time that Iran has uh, targeted Israeli, Israel and Israelis around the, the globe, but it is the first time that it has launched from Israel its uh, uh, territory uh, and attack on Israel. We we'd also had relations with Iran until 1979. Some people forget that. Yeah. So the Iranians argue, have stated that their attack was in response to the Israeli strike on the, the, Iranian, the Iranian consulate. In yeah, there wasn't, it wasn't an, an Iranian consulate. It was a building that was next to the Iranian embassy, wedged between the Iranian embassy and the uh, Canadian embassy uh, in Damascus. Uh, and I can promise you that uh, the, the generals who were there uh, were not there for sightseeing or buying anything in the Damascus souk. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that they mm. had, were active tourists while they were there. But, um, but so then, from moving from the most recent events to the broader broader scope of the war in Gaza. It's been roughly six, a little bit more than six months. Correct. Since Israel. Um, 192 days. 192 days. Yes. To do. What is, just for the, for the for sake of our audience, just what is Israel's objective in this war? What, what are you trying to achieve? Well, first and foremost, we'd like to have uh, 
hostages back. Uh, as you know, uh, on October the 7th, uh, some 250 uh, Israeli, uh, mainly civilians, uh, were taken from their homes uh, and dragged across uh, the fence into the Gaza Strip. Uh, secondly, uh, we were... One second, yes. one second. Mm -hmm. uh, after six months, how many hostages have been rescued by, the, by Israeli forces? Um, very few, unfortunately. Uh, the last two that were rescued, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's only three have been rescued. Uh, there have been uh, 120 or so uh, released, uh, of them 89, if I'm not mistaken, Israelis. Um, uh, and the others are uh, foreign, foreign citizens. We still have uh, 133 uh, hostages left on the Iranian side of them, four uh, who have been held uh, by the Hamas terrorists uh, for more than seven to ten years. Um, so, yes, we do also unfortunately think that uh, at least uh, 30 of uh, those hostages uh, are no longer alive. Uh, but since the Red Cross has not uh, visited uh, or been allowed uh, to see any of the hostages ever since they were taken uh, hostage, uh, it's very, very difficult to verify uh, the numbers. And it's part of a psychological game that the terrorist organizations are playing with us. And I'm sure you know, any person of goodwill sort of prays for the return of the hostages as soon as possible. Definitely. But I didn't mean to cut you off, Ambassador. I just wanted to get details on that. And you said the second objective. Well, the second objective is to make sure that uh, Hamas uh, can never do uh, something like this again. Uh, and when we say never do it again, we mean it. Uh, there was a ceasefire on the 6th of October. Uh, Hamas uh, in a genocidal attack on uh, the state of Israel, uh, broke that ceasefire. And uh, uh, we, uh, our objective now is to make sure that uh, the Hamas will not be able to continue to govern on the other side uh, of the fence and uh, will be eliminated as a fighting force. Uh, and uh, we will be able to uh, at least bring some of our uh, internal refugees back to uh, their homes. We already have more than 130,000 internal refugees in Israel, both from uh, the Gaza envelope and uh, the border with Lebanon. And from the north. Uh, um, so, Master, my understanding is that Hamas was founded in the 1980s during the Israeli occupation of Gaza. Given that, what would a military campaign that destroys Hamas's ability to function sort of look like if a previous multi-decade occupation did not succeed in, in sort of eliminating it? Well, I think that uh, uh, we didn't really uh, go in and deal with the problem for the last 16 years. As you know, uh, Hamas violently uh, took over the uh, Gaza Strip uh, in 2006, uh, and uh, uh, it has been in, in power there for the last 16 years, embedding itself uh, uh, and running uh, the area for uh, some 16 years, uh, and uh, borrowing under the Gaza Strip and wasting uh, the money that has been given by uh, a lot of uh, do-gooders uh, who have uh, tried to help the Palestinian people and instead the money was used uh, for uh, uh, strengthening the terrorist tunnels and uh, not really investing in the Palestinian people. So every war must end. Let's assume that Israel does achieve these objectives. In its, con in its campaign. What is the Israeli government's vision for the future of the Gaza Strip when the war is over? Well, the first and foremost, as I said, uh, we uh, have not yet uh, got to that, uh, that uh, stage in, uh, uh, in, in the war. Uh, we are still on a war foot footing, though there are less and less Israeli um, soldiers in the Gaza Strip at the moment, though uh, uh, we do continue uh, and see the situation uh, until we can uh, find some kind of way of uh, uh, eliminating the threat that will come from the Hamas terrorists and then uh, uh, where it goes. There are lots of ideas on the table. Uh, there is not one idea. Uh, America has its ideas, uh, the Arab world has different ideas, uh, uh, etc. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we have to uh, make sure that we uh, win this war. So, so, Ambassador, just to push you on that, there's nothing out of the ordinary about announcing what your post-war and desired post-war end state is during a war. 
during the Second World War, for example, the Allies were very clear as to what they wanted the world, the world to look like after the war was over. So in the Israeli government, cool. I'm sure there's been some discussion about there what has, possible... There work. has been discussion. Uh, I don't think that uh, the uh, Israeli government uh, of today has uh, one uh, gelled idea as to how they see uh, the situation. I think that uh, we are going to still have to see uh, where uh, this war takes us. Uh, it's not only a war in the Gaza Strip, as you know. Uh, we, have, we are uh, fighting, uh, uh, would I say... I would call it a, a sort of relatively low-intensity war uh, with another of uh, Iran's proxies, uh, Hezbollah, across the Lebanese border. Uh, we get missiles from the Houthis in uh, Yemen, uh, and uh, their proxies both in uh, Syria and Iraq uh, do their utmost uh, to uh, uh, damage uh, Western interests uh, uh, around uh, the Middle East. So... Uh, I think uh, in, in certain ways we are a little bit too early uh, to focus. What we'd definitely like uh, at the end of this is to make sure that uh, the people on the other side of the fence live uh, peacefully with the state of Israel and do not try uh, and uh, once again, uh, or as they have said again and again, uh, uh, attack us in a genocidal way, uh, trying to eliminate the state of Israel. So when I think about the people on the other side of the fence, when I, I'm a professor, and I often mm -hmm. tell my students the most important thing you can do in any conflict, in any negotiation, is put yourself in the shoes of the other side. If you, if, that if you want to succeed on your own side, you should try to understand it from their perspective. So I think about the West Bank, where the Palestinian Authority has recognized Israel's right to exist, but the months since October 7th have seen a pretty substantial uptick in violence directed at the, at, the, at the Palestinians who are living in the West Bank. And we have some numbers on what that looks like now. So we're, we can say that 428 have been killed since October, since October 7th, including 110 children, a few, almost more than 4,000 injured, more than 1,200 displaced. And um, there have been 704 accounted for Israeli settler attacks against Palestinians. And there's been expansion of, of settlements in the West Bank that are under Israeli law, not, not inter, inter, inter Israeli law accounted for as illegal. I wonder, from their perspective, if you were a Palestinian living in the West Bank, you might say, we have actually agreed that Israel has a right to exist. We are not participating in these attacks. But the violence keeps getting directed against us. What would I mean? What would you say to them? Well, first and foremost, you've just given a one-sided no, no, uh, focus of, you should of, say your own. of yeah. the violence yeah. because uh, it's not uh, they uh, the the violence has continued on the Palestinian side, and it's uh, definitely uh, the vast majority of those who have been uh, uh, killed on the West Bank uh, over the last uh, few months. Uh, have uh, definitely had their uh, connections both with n not the Palestinian Authority always, uh, but with Hamas and with the uh, Islamic Jihad and with uh, 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 Iran. And uh, so it's not as if uh, uh, one is uh, just focusing on uh, on uh, uh, killing uh, people. Uh, there is a, a, a reason behind the activity of the Israeli forces uh, in uh, Judea and Samaria, or as you said, the West Bank. Uh, and I think that this is something uh, that not, doesn't always come out. And the, and the displacements and the expansion of, of, sort of, of what seem to be permanent settlements in the West Bank over that uh, time? Structure? There have been uh, settlements that have been built over the last uh, nearly 60 years uh, 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 in uh, Judea and Samaria, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, in certain areas, uh, of course, continues. Uh, but uh, I definitely uh, do understand uh, the, uh, the, what uh, has been uh, uh, shown as uh, settler violence, and I think that uh, in uh, many ways we have tried to uh, curb this and uh, to focus on it. Uh, only last week uh, a, a young uh, Jewish shepherd boy uh, was uh, murdered, and that caused uh, a conflagration of, uh, uh, of violence uh, by uh, uh, those who uh, were connected. Uh, that is un uh, in certain ways uh, understandable, but uh, it shouldn't be the way uh, that things uh, go forward. And so the ribbon steps have been taken, or, and will be taken more steps in future. As far as I know, uh, uh, definitely there are steps uh, also taken, not only uh, by us. And so then, to switch our focus back to Gaza, um, so when I, when I teach on international ethics of war, what I say is that there are two questions you have to answer. Why did you fight the war? 
and how do you fight the war? And you've, you've explained, to, explained to what, why Israel is choosing to fight this war, is fighting this war, that it was a ceasefire that was broken. So choosing was not the right word. My apologies for that. Yeah, it's okay. um, so I, I did not mean to say that. I want to be clear fine. on that. Um, why Israel is fighting this war. Um, th- there have been questions about how. Israel's fighting this war in Gaza. And I think they were brought to a head by the death, the tragic death of seven civilians in the world and who were working with World Central Kitchen. Correct. A little bit. And could you talk a little bit about the measures that are being taken to try and prevent those things from happening again? Well, uh, when looking at uh, conflict in the modern age, I don't think there's ever been such a complicated conflict. Uh, first and foremost, because of where uh, it's taking place. Uh, and what happens on the battlefield. And it's not only on the battlefield, it's uh, below the battlefield, and it's around the battlefield. Uh, When you have an organization, a terrorist organization, that has embedded itself and literally embedded itself under hospitals, under schools, under mosques, under uh, uh, homes uh, throughout the Gaza Strip, I mean... uh, as far as we we thought we knew that there were X amount of hundreds of kilometers of tunnels, but uh, we were surprised by the extra amount. Uh, if in the beginning we thought maybe 250, 300 miles of tunnels, it looks like they're more between four and 500 miles of tunnels under the Gaza Strip. Imagine uh, what could have been done uh, had that money been put into the... Um, uh, into the uh, uh, Palestinian society and what it could have been uh, instead of what it is at, uh, today. Uh, so uh, the, the focus, uh, as uh, is said, what uh, we uh, would like to uh, see, I think, in the end is a uh, uh, demilitarized uh, Palestinian uh, area that will definitely be Uh, run uh, by uh, the people who are on the other side uh, and definitely not by us. But uh, uh, for the moment, uh, and I said, as you yourself mentioned, we are still in the middle of a war. It uh, has not finished and um, I would hope that it would be able to be, would have been finished long ago, but it hasn't. And it's still going on. Uh, And I think that this is where uh, we are trying uh, to head. And when you compare the figures, however devastating war is, and war is horrific because people, especially in this country, don't go through the war. I mean, uh, one of the things that one looks at uh, in the American society is that uh, less than uh, 1% of the American citizens are... Uh, or have served in the army, whereas around about 60 to 70 percent of the Israeli uh, uh, civilians have served in uh, the Israeli army. So the majority of us are, would I say, veterans to to, uh, all intents and purposes. And uh, we have been trying to uh, protect ourselves for years and years and years. So, So look at the building codes in Israel. The building codes in Israel have a secure room yeah. in every single home. So, so Master, uh, just, just to push you on this, um, mm-hmm. I, I, I've been to Israel, and I don't doubt that the strike is, the, the stress is, but when you're fighting a war, obligations to protect civilians are not contingent. But, um, they're not, they're, the, the, the Israel itself is a signatory to the Geneva Accords. Um, Israel, and has, s- Israel has done things for the civilian population that no other country has done in the history of modern warfare and uh, with all uh, you know uh, the f- the focus uh, I-, I definitely think uh, that the story uh, about how the war is being uh, fought is definitely not uh, the one that is on the ground and uh, this is part and parcel of, of so many different things and so many different layers whether it is uh, uh, the information that comes through uh, uh, social media whether it is what what is going on this is something that is uh, so, so. very problematic whether it is phoning the people telling them to get out of the area uh, and sending uh, flyers uh, from from the air uh, etc etc., actually even uh, issuing maps of where we are going to be uh, militarily active. So So, this is something that that doesn't happen. And not only that, then Israel is expected uh, to continue uh, 
uh, giving um, gas uh, to the uh, the terrorists and uh, and all sorts of other things which we do uh, and, so, and also those who say that there is uh, mass starvation is really i would say even an outright lie so uh, ambassador so I, I haven't been to gaza so i can't tell you firsthand well, um, neither have i people but have, I but, can definitely tell you that but i note that haaretz which is not social media mm -hmm. it's i think I, you would agree um, one of maybe the most important but certainly one of the most important israeli newspapers has run reports on incidents in gaza and i'm gonna i'm gonna note two for you um, one on the particular incident of the world central kitchen bombing they had a quote there that an israeli defense source saying we're trying our hardest to accurately hit terrorists and utilizing every threat of intelligence. And in the end, the units in the field decide to launch attacks without any preparation in cases that have nothing to do with protecting our forces. That's not social media. That's, that's Haaretz. And then a second report that yes. ran a little okay. later that, uh, that, where they, that they've said that the Israel created kill zones in Gaza and that anyone who crosses into them is shot. In practice, a terrorist is anyone the IDF has killed in the areas in which its forces operate. So as a reserve officer who has served in Gaza. So... I'm not denying that the, not disagreeing with you that the Israeli government has made statement, has made efforts to try and protect civilians, saying that the Israeli press is raising real issues about the way the war is being fought. And I wonder if you could say that. Well, I think that, yeah. yes, uh, of course the Israeli press is uh, a free press and it's allowed to uh, write whatever it likes, which I think uh, is something that you won't find on the other side. Uh, but uh, definitely uh, uh, what uh, you see is... Uh, one or two reports, as you have said, and uh, I think I don't have specific answers for uh, the uh, the points that you have raised, but I will definitely try and uh, get the answers for you uh, so that uh, they can be uh, pro uh, uh, projected or or, or, uh, uh, or seen uh, both by you and uh, by your viewers. But uh, definitely, uh, I think that uh, uh, you will find that. Uh, uh, in the majority of the instances, and, and uh, there are cases where the Israeli army, uh, if something is brought up, does check the, uh, the case. And I will, as I said, uh, check those uh, cases. But, of course, when it comes to uh, uh, the WCK, uh, uh, we have already had uh, a, a, a first-level uh, investigation, and uh, this has been... Will there published. be an independent investigation of this? Uh, the investigation of was the, conducted by the IDF. Will there be an independent the investigation? The IDF uh, has a very capable uh, way of, uh, of checking its uh, forces, and it does nominate people from outside of the army who, were, who know... Uh, enough about uh, military uh, military ambassador uh, I, I have more friends who served in the IDF than I can count so I, I don't doubt that capability but if you were Jose Andres you might say I would really like an independent investigation I think he would understand that so is there going to be an independent investigation of the strike not that I know of because I think that the investigation that was carried out was a very quick uh, be very uh, focused and uh, see I think it was uh, a well-conducted uh, investigation that did come out uh, as you uh, saw uh, we uh, uh, first and foremost recognized it. I'd like to see other armies recognize uh, the, the problems immediately after, after they happened. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, yes, there are uh, zones uh, that uh, uh, people are uh, told not to go into. Uh, so if uh, it's not as if uh, they are... Uh, um, uh, they are secret zones, uh, uh, and uh, in the middle of a war, uh, this is what happens. People fight in the middle of a war. People die in war. Um, uh, when it comes to the war, uh, some uh, uh, 300 Israeli soldiers have already uh, died ever since, uh, or since uh, Israel uh, went into the Gaza Strip, uh, and this is uh, not something that is... Uh, uh, is a small uh, step. Uh, we, we understood. I think this is one of the reasons why Israel uh, hesitated a long time and, and waited for so many years before it actually uh, tried to deal with the problems on the other side of the fence. And so, Master, also, I, I can't let you go without talking about U.S.-Israeli relations, which have just been highlighted by the United States helping to defend Israel in this Correct. recent attack. Which we have thanked uh, the United States uh, again and again, yes. But uh, I think... There has been a lot of stress on that relationship during the war. I think highlighted most by Chuck Schumer, the most senior Jewish elected official in American history, making a statement on the floor of the Senate that he wanted Prime Minister Netanyahu to step down. 
And I wonder if you could comment on that level of, un, I would say, almost unprecedented level of tension between the U.S. and Israel. Well, I, uh, Chuck uh, Schumer and I do not know each other, and I don't think I should comment on, uh, on what he said, but I definitely think uh, that uh, everybody is entitled to uh, his or her uh, opinion. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think that uh, what goes on internally and how it goes on should be left to the Israeli people and uh, not to, uh, to others uh, uh, to, uh, to tell us how to uh, run our affairs. Uh, I think in the end, uh, you saw before uh, October the 7th a very vibrant Israeli uh, uh, public who for 39 weeks uh, uh, was out on the streets uh, demonstrating uh, against the Israeli government. So I think that what you can see is that this is not something that is uh, only uh, focused from abroad into Israel. Uh, there are very interesting uh, uh, focuses in Israeli society, and uh, I would say that there is a schism in Israeli uh, society uh, that is not an easy uh, one to deal with, but uh, it's dealt with democratically in democratic elections. So, Master, it, it's striking because, in fact, like a traditional norm of diplomacy is that one does not interfere in another country's internal domestic politics. But if, you know, when we look at this, um, I, I think I have a picture here of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu when he was testifying at, at this point as a private citizen in favor of the Iraq war, as the United States was making the decision whether or not to invade in Iraq. This is a picture of him speaking before the House of Representatives when he was prime minister at the invitation of the Republicans in the House, not the president of the United States. This is quite remarkable for a head of government to speak in this setting. And um, that we have an, actually an interview of him discussing about his view of American politics, where this was, it's a videotape that I think was quite striking. So, from my perspective, it seems like the Israeli government is perfectly happy to well. talk about it, talk about American domestic politics. So it's not, maybe not surprising that it's going the other direction. Well, I, I, he was there, surrounded by a family with a ch with children. I don't know. Uh, I've, it's the first time I've ever seen that uh, that video, so I really don't know. And. Uh, uh, and I definitely am not going to comment on uh, on that. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, as you can uh, see, um, uh, I, the uh, uh, the prime minister of the state of Israel has been invited, if I'm not mistaken, three times to uh, uh, to speak in front of uh, the United States Congress, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu I'm talking about, uh, and uh, uh, I have heard from democratic politicians uh, over the years that I've been here uh, that they see uh, 2015, the speech uh, uh, in Congress, as a, a kind of watershed. Uh, but uh, once again, uh, this was uh, an official invitation to the Prime Minister of Israel uh, uh, some nine years ago. Uh, in the uh, uh, in the Congress, and uh, I uh, uh, will leave it uh, to uh, to professors like you to uh, uh, to talk about it and to uh, and to read things into it. Well, thank you. On on that note, Ambassador Marilyn Rubin, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for having me.